Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, listeners. This week, you've just got me in debt because <laughs> uh, Joseph is not feeling well. I think he has the flu, so he's fine, but he's just taking the day off. We told him to stay in bed. Um, so hopefully, Deb and I are, are going to do a good enough job today. We wanted to talk about fame. I mean, I've, I've been really interested in this subject. It, uh, I think, deserves a psychological take on it. Obviously, fame has always been with us. As long as there's been culture, there have been, you know, celebrities. And uh, what, what, can we, what can we learn about uh, the, the nature of the psyche through looking at fame and the dynamics around fame? So we're going we're gonna to take a crack at it. And, you know, in a way, uh, the antidote uh, to fame, which has to do with the outer world, is your inner world. And you know where I'm going, which is toward dream school. Uh, There is no better way to get in touch with what is going on in your inner world than by looking at and learning how to understand a little better your dreams. We dream every single night, so there it is, available, uh, a way to access your inner world. So um, if you're listening to our podcast and like what we do, and you know we analyze a dream every week, hop on over to our website, thisjungianlife.com, and take a look. Just take a look at Dream School. So as I said in the introduction, you know, fame has always been with us. There were famous people in the ancient world. There were kings and heroes and military commanders and poets and playwrights that were famous. And uh, of course, you know, there have been famous people throughout history. These days, uh, I think social media has kind of even brought uh, a new level to this in some way, because now you can pursue fame sort of on the basis of just being famous. There's that phenomenon of people who are famous for being famous. Um, and uh, so how do we understand this? What do we, how do we underst- what do we think about this psychologically? It's a really interesting phenomenon, and I can't help but contrast uh, ancient days and the fame that military commanders and playwrights and philosophers achieved for what they did in the world uh, with today's obsession uh, with celebrity and that what we value are are sports stars, and of course they are doing things in in the world, whether whatever sport it is that they're terrifically good at, uh, entertainers, you mm-hmm. know, and of course those are people with tremendous uh, talents. But it's a very different um, place where we put value mm-hmm. uh, from military commanders, philosophers, political leaders, and kings. Uh, something has really I shifted. I, 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 I mean, I, you know, obviously there are still famous, uh, um, you know, political leaders. Political leaders tend to be famous. Um, I, I'm, I think that entertainers are a special breed and that in some way they're kind of like our shamans. So I think a really hmm. talented entertainer um is 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 not i'm not ready to kind of put that on a different level i think someone who's brilliant at writing songs or performing or a brilliant actor uh you know deserves our admiration Mm -hmm. uh and perhaps perhaps what's shifted is we are less likely to 
uh, admire military heroes, and maybe that's not a bad thing. So I, I don't know. I mean, but but what is true is that we seem to have a need to venerate people. Mm -hmm. I'm going back uh, to a little bit of a difference of opinion that we may have about this, okay. which is it seems to me that today's celebrity world, uh, and it's not that I would devalue people with a talent for performing or sports, but uh, it's younger people, uh, people who are glamorous, people who are beautiful, mm -hmm. people, there's a lot of novelty. Mm -hmm. um, a, a tremendous obsession, it seems to me, with image of how you look mm -hmm. and how you how you present yourself. Uh, that there's a, a huge emphasis on presentation, performance, uh, exterior stuff, you know, versus yeah. military commanders, philosophers, poets, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly singers. Mm -hmm. But but that we want the appearance now, and we don't see uh, too many people up there who are, you know, sort of old and gray. Uh, being beautiful seems to r really matter. Well, I, you know what what might be different because I'm 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 just off of rereading the story of Eros and Psyche, and <laughs> of course, how that story gets going is that Psyche is so beautiful. That That's people right. start to worship her uh, yeah. as if she were, um, you know, the uh, the goddess Aphrodite herself, and mm -hmm. that gets Psyche into some trouble. And she doesn't ask for it; she doesn't bring it on herself. She just is that beautiful, and so people venerate her. So I think we've always been entranced with beauty. Mm. The difference may be that these days we can transmit images so much more easily. I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, uh, when King Henry VIII wanted to know what his bride-to-be might look like, he had to send mm. Hans Holbein to paint a portrait and then carry the portrait home on a ship. And now we can transmit photographs, you know, this sort of instantaneously. So that has certainly changed mm -hmm. things. And I think you're right, Deb, it's kind of shifted it in the direction of uh, really being focused on the visual image. And that has really prioritized um, mm -hmm. beauty and youth and glamor. That, that is certainly true. So there is something there about beauty, and it's age old, mm -hmm. uh, but that we, in a way, we're seduced by it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seduced by uh, tremendous talent mm -hmm. uh, f for people that can perform, people that can sing, and and the story of uh, Psyche and Eros. I mean, that was what she was famous for. She yeah. was simply yes. so beautiful mm -hmm. uh, that there is something in us that responds uh, to that to that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I, I think I think there's a way we want to venerate someone. We want to admire someone who has almost superhuman beauty or superhuman talent. And and when you see someone do something and they're so good at it, whether or not it's um, yeah. you know a sports a sports figure or uh, you know someone who's um, playing music or you know they're such a virtuoso or they're so creative, something lights up in us and and we 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 just mm. we we want to love that person. We want to shower them with admiration. That there's something human about that. You know, that makes me think about Jung, who wrote about the mana personality, mm -hmm. uh, the person who is larger than life, the person, uh, today we would say, uh, who has charisma. Mm -hmm. um, back in the days of, of heroes, uh, those were mana personalities. Mm -hmm. uh, Theseus could go to Crete, and uh, Ariadne fell in love with him as soon as she saw him, right. and he knew that he was the one who could slay the Minotaur, mm -hmm. of, of that there is something where we project what can a human being be? 
can can we be more than our ordinary limited selves and we see that in in heroes and in people with special with special talent and we tend mm-hmm. to venerate them um as heroes or even sort of godlike beings and i'm thinking of some of the uh concerts where people just pay incredible amounts of money to go and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This will really date me, but I remember <laughs> Elvis Presley. <laughs> yes, yeah. And some of the adults in my life were sim- simply, they were kind of appalled. I mean, they weren't horrified, but they just thought it was absurd and ridiculous. Uh, all, all the teenagers yelling and howling and, and screaming uh, mm-hmm. over him. But it does illustrate Jung's idea of the mana personality. It He's indeed. It's more than uh, just just an ordinary person. He, mm-hmm. he, they, people, heroes, performers do have more than we do, and I think they elevate the possibility yes. of what yeah. it what it can mean to be special, to be human, to have mm-hmm. more, mm-hmm. Um, and that we project that on, onto performers. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a couple, there's a couple things here. First of all, you know, following up on what you're saying, I think one of the positive roles that this can play, this kind of ad, adulation mm-hmm. is, oh my gosh, that's so amazing. I'd love to do that myself, you know? And, and I, I love the stories that you occasionally hear about, um, some actor or musician who always mm-hmm. really looked up maybe to some other performer and then there they are, and they're actually now they're starring in the same movie, or you know, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're the opening band yeah. for the person they used to admire so much. You know, that those stories always tickle me because it's like the younger person saw in that older person, maybe that more famous person, there is a possibility of something I could be. I'm catching a glimpse, mm-hmm. perhaps, of my own destiny, and I'm inspired by that person's creativity, by that person's expertise and that's going to propel me to kind of become my best self but but i think there's also something else here which is when we see fame it has a kind of larger than life quality to it absolutely and it 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 is it is um our attempt at being something like godlike it is it is our attempt to touch immortality. You know who was very um bold and honest about this actually was the Renaissance Italian poet Petrarch. Petrarch mm. and fancied himself uh, you know, like the poets of the ancient world, and he it was very important to him to be um to be per- depicted wearing a crown of laurels mm. and to reach I mean I mean, being famous was a way of uh kind of becoming immortal. Um, It was the closest thing. I mean, it probably still is the closest thing to kind of becoming in a god. You know, you're sort of achieving an apotheosis when you, your name is a household word and you're going to, your memory will outlive you and maybe your works will outlive you. And, and so I I think there's that we're, we're in this realm of, of, um, Godlikeness. Another way to think of that is inflation. A- absolutely, and and it does, and it can uh, take over. Uh, that people, and I think we know, you know, from stories of of certain performers of the identification uh, with the image that's that's on the mm-hmm. screen. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm going back to the adulation and the inspiration. Yeah. That that people who are mega talented and they're larger than life afford us. And I wonder if it gives us a glimpse of what uh, individuation can look like. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. You know that that it can be really great, um, that we can be more yeah uh, than than our ordinary selves and we and we catch some of that uh when we are inspired yeah yeah uh b- by someone and then and then there's always the fear that they're going to disappoint you and mm. show that they're mere mortals 
So I, I'm thinking, you know, some people that I really admire, I think they're incredibly talented. I think they also are incredibly, um, they have all this integrity. And I, I can just imagine how disappointed I would be if I, you know, woke up and read a headline that the, the person was found doing something really, uh, you know, debased or something. It would be, but, but I think you're exactly right, Deb. I really like that, that we see like, like what the potential, what we could be. Yeah. And, and it's so complicated because we desperately want that. We, we want to be able to model ourselves after someone who's more individuated, who's more actualized. And that's why it's, mm -hmm. it can be so crushing when our, when our heroes, you know, reveal themselves to have, you know, feet of clay. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's crushing and uh, we take a certain satisfaction in it, don't we? Well, Oftentimes I th I th when I our idols are brought low. You know, it, it's interesting because, I mean, I think I was reflecting on this recently by, by watching what happened with Russell Brand. So for mm. years, you know, people were happy to heap projections on mm. this, you know, person who is arguably, you know, very talented. Um, but but the 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 crowds were were happy to uh, yeah. to to heap admiration and projections. I mean, we haven't talked about projection yet, but that's a huge part of it. You know, you're going to kind of you're going to carry this for me. You're going to carry my sense of. Uh, being more um, actualized or talented or having uh, or being kind of touched by the gods, as I think very talented people, it does feel that way sometimes. Yeah. And, and then uh, I'm j the mob is just as happy to turn on you and exactly. lend you limb to limb. And this is also very archetypal, you know? I mean, it reminds me of the, the play The Bacchae, by I think it's I think it's Euripides. I, I think um, so too. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I got that right. Where you know Dionysus kind of bespells the women uh, to to mm -hmm. participate in these rites out in the woods, and they they're they're mad with uh, kind of Dionysian you know just uh, energy. And they they rend Pentheus limb to limb, including his own mother, because she doesn't know what she's doing. And and in some sense, I think there is a there is a kind of mob psychology that's involved with fame. I mean, Deb, you referenced it with uh, talking about Elvis. I mean, some of it is this kind of contagion mm -hmm. effect where where you know, the, the whole the whole groups of people are, are en masse projecting something onto an individual. But that because it's a because it's a mass of people, a mob, you know, Jung was very distrustful of mob psychology. This the just just a slightly different breeze can blow and people can go in the other direction and there's kind of no thought about mm -hmm. uh well well wait a minute, what what are we doing here? Yeah, there, there's a real two-sidedness uh, to that. And uh, in the story of, of Dionysus, Pentheus, and, and his women followers, the Maenads, yeah. uh, you know, of course, Dionysus uh, brought wine to the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where are the limits of that? Yeah. Of, uh, where is... That kind of holiday uh, drinking festival in the woods, kind kind of culturally contained, and where does it get out of control? And we see that it gets out of control a lot um, at certain concert halls and other kinds of things where mob psychology takes over, uh, and that we can be inspired and uh, mm -hmm. adulate. Uh, some kind of a figure, and then when that figure is brought low, you know, and you use the example of, of Russell Brand, of that there is a certain kind of schadenfreude yeah. or, or envy that yeah. is like, there's a certain satisfaction in it, yep. uh, like the people at the Dionysian Festival mm -hmm. um, who, who, could tear, uh, who could tear the king apart. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to be a little careful, a little, maybe even a little skeptical 
about what is it that we're worshiping. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. what is it that we're projecting? Yes. Uh, that you you just yes. brought that in. What do we project onto uh, some of our some of our stars? Uh, yeah, well, let, let's yeah. talk about projection. Before we do, I want to say one more thing. Maybe, maybe the truth is that you know, when when one is famous, one steps into a current that one cannot control. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I think that that's you, you know that that is these stories of someone um, kind of being laid low, stepping stepping in it, disappointing people. Having mm -hmm. the crowd turn on them. I mean, that is uh, that is an age old story. So, what we're talking about here is that this is the stuff of the gods. Yes. And when humans appropriate it to themselves, um, we we need to be careful of uh, have we stepped outside our our limited human. Mm -hmm. Uh, identity and lim all the limitations of being human mm -hmm. and that there is something about fame where if you have a whole concert hall or stadium rocking with you and there is one performer up on the stage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is of the gods that is more than mm -hmm. one human can really arrogate to him or herself well, and, so, and you step into that stream, and yeah. you don't you don't control it. You don't control it, right? And and, and it controls you, actually. And I mm -hmm. I want to talk about that more in a minute. But um, but just to talk for for a second about projection. So so one of the things that happens when we're a performer, say, is that uh, to the extent that we have captivated the audience, they are projecting something on us. And, uh, you know, that is, uh, again, a very um, tricky process because often what's getting projected on a beloved performer is a kind of self energy. So the self, you know, Jung said about it, we might as well call it the God within. And when we fall in love with a performer or some other public figure, uh, a politician, whoever it is, we're projecting part of the self onto that person. Mm. And that is some heady stuff. I mean, this can happen in the analytic dyad. Often it does. It's actually part of the curative factor that the, the an analysand can project the self onto the analyst. And we mm. all know, those of us that do this work, how perilous that is. Because y you know when you're having that projected on you and it is... It is really heady stuff, and it's it's difficult not to identify with it. You know, you've got someone who really admires you, who's sort of looking at you, and you know that they think you're just brilliant, and you can fix anything. And it's <laughs> it's a temptation to identify with that. And if you do, you're you're gonna slip and fall. Um, but, of course, you know, we know in our work that we have to be able to hold that very gently and tenderly until the patient's ready to take back the projection. So if it operates in such a powerful way when it's just one-on-one, -on -one, you know, what is it like when it's literally millions of people projecting stuff mm -hmm. onto you? And I think that, um, you know, this explains in part why a lot of young people who get famous, say, as, you know, as Ad children or adolescents, they, they have a terribly hard time. M many of them kind of don't make the way th make their find their way mm -hmm. through. They, they, they get lost in addiction. They aren't able to sustain things. I mean, there's a story after story after story of young, famous people who, who really kind of get into trouble. And, and I think it's because how, how do you, you, you have to have such a sturdy ego to maintain your stance without getting just kind of bowled over by these projections. And I think, I think that the projections of others, you know, it is kind of an energetic thing. I mean, I, I worked with a woman once and I, I did, I did ask her her permission to discuss this and she was happy to give me permission. So I just want you to know I'm, I'm not uh, revealing this information without having discussed this explicitly with her, but she uh, was a very talented performer, 
And uh, she would, you know, she was on her way as a, in a career as a performer. And it was making her sick. And mm-hmm. she stepped away from it, which, which you know, I, I really, um, I have some sense of, of, of what it kind of took for her to do that. Because, you know, she, she, she has this kind of God-given talent that just not many people have. I mean, mm-hmm. this is a talent that you just, you're just either born with it or you're not. And she yeah. has it in, in spades. But, but, but for her, the act of being on stage and being the recipient of all of that psychic energy in the form mm-hmm. of projection was um, just making it very difficult for her to stay in touch with herself. She was having all kinds of symptoms. It was just leading her down a very difficult path. And uh, so she made the, I think, very wise decision to step away from it. And now she she does the thing that she can mm-hmm. do so well, you know, um, in ways that, that bring her pleasure, but don't expose her to this incredibly kind of intoxicating mm-hmm. uh, experience of having this all projected on you. Yeah. Uh, it takes me to what Jung says uh, over and over again, which is psychic energy is real. Uh, it is contagious. It's powerful. Um, and it, it's a huge burden. And I'm thinking yep. about about performers that have suffered mm-hmm. uh, for, with their uh, celebrity status. It's just really difficult because then they start to identify, I think, uh, with the, uh, that that figure up on the screen or up on the stage is who who yeah. I am. Yes. Uh, the the larger than life. Uh, I don't have to play by the usual rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, you do need a very sturdy ego and a sense of self, and that's hard one for anyone. But I'm thinking of here's my little list of uh, Marilyn Monroe. Mm-hmm. Elvis Presley, Michael Jackson, mm-hmm. uh, Judy Garland, mm-hmm. Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, John Belushi, mm-hmm. uh, River Phoenix. Uh, that uh, and there's a statistic that celebrities have a suicide rate that's almost four times larger uh, Robin than Williams. In, yeah, so there's. There's a cost mm-hmm. uh, to taking on these godlike yeah. attributes, and your point about natural talent is so well taken that yeah. you know the truth of the matter is that they there are God given gifts, absolutely, and and so people can do more mm-hmm. uh, in some way. They are more, yeah. Uh, sometimes there are wisdom figures. I mean, that might be the the projection that certain uh, wisdom figures or analysts get that we've seen more deeply into things and and can somehow bestow that or impart that uh, versus helping you find it in you mm-hmm. or your or yourself. But we do hope to get it to receive it from uh, those who, who somehow have the magic it. And now, and now we're in the realm of kind of the guru, right? Mm-hmm. Th- these people who get these things projected on them, and then sometimes these people really kind of revel in that and take it on, and then, of course, there's these abuses of that. You know, I, first of all, I just want to say, Deb, I love what you said, that psychic energy is real. And I do think that when... When we're famous, I mean, this I'm judging this, you know, from this 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 woman that I worked with. It's, you know, the experience of having the audience in front of you, sort of applauding you. I mean, that is there's a real there's a real burden that we carry from that. You know, it 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 it's 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 real. Psychic energy is real. So uh, to, just to just to pick up on this just a little bit more. Um, you know this this notion about um, uh, kind of identifying with what the audience wants us to be, 
mm-hmm. and 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 then losing touch with who we are. Um, I'm thinking of Judy Garland. Apparently, mm-hmm. uh, this might be an apocryphal story. I can't remember now where I heard it. But apparently there's this uh, late in her career, there's this uh, performance that she did, and I think she was probably intoxicated during the performance, and she's begging the audience to applaud. She's mm. just, she just can't survive without the applause. You know, she just didn't know who she was anymore. Versus our friend Jung, who I think, you know, mm-hmm. toward the end of his life, he, he, had, he had amassed a, a certain amount of fame and notoriety. Yeah. But he was very clear he wasn't interested in kind of speaking to the general public because he didn't think they would understand. So, you know, he gave lectures to small groups of people. He had the psychology club in Zurich. But he didn't do a lot of very public stuff. You know, he did that BBC interview. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he would, he would uh, you know, t- talk again in kind of sm- small circles. But he, he didn't... He didn't do a lot of public appearances. He didn't write for the general public. And then um, the guy who did the BBC interview, I can't remember his name right now, um, but he approached Jung and and said, you know, what about doing a a book for the general public? And Jung said, no, 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 thank you. I'm not interested. They're not going to understand, so I'm I'm not going to do it. So he was famous in spite of the fact that he had never courted it, right? And he'd, he'd pretty... I think I'm correct, Deb. You cor- you yeah. fill me in if I'm getting this wrong, but he had not really done many high-profile things. I mean, I'm thinking like maybe what the Clark lectures early in his career, you know. But, but he hadn't. Those you know, are all. Those are all so long ago. They're in person. Yeah, yeah. So you know, you can touch some number of people, but not the at the level of magnification. That we yeah, have today. Most of what we have are his writings for these, you know, fairly kind of obscure yeah. journals, or he was going to give a talk at, you know, uh, at at, at um, uh, Aranos or uh, you know the the Psychology Club, um, or you know, uh, write the foreword to some book, or you know, he wrote lots of letters, but he he wasn't out there courting the public. Then he had a dream. So this guy from BBC asked him, would you do a book for the public? And Jung said no. And then Jung had a dream that he was, uh, and I'm doing this from memory, so I might be getting some of the details wrong, but he was at, there was a tree and it was bearing fruit and he was standing before a crowd of thousands and he was taking the tree from the fruit and making it and giving it to people. And so he called the guy back. He said, yeah, I'll do the book. Mm Mm-hmm. So, so the, 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 the idea to speak to a wider audience was influenced not by a desire for fame, but by a deep awareness that he might have something to offer people. And, uh, and so, you know, so that's, that's a very, very different kind of uh, energy there. I think it's the difference of being in service to... Uh, ideas to to work to a craft to art uh, that that you are in service to that rather than I am that mm-hmm. uh, once like your your story about Judy Garland uh, is deeply poignant uh, that she needed the applause she needed the reassurance she needed the approval of whatever all that was for her of receiving, you know, the crowd's endorsement and validation. And it's momentary. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you get a a standing ovation that lasts for 10 minutes, uh, it's momentary. Mm -hmm. And Jung was in service to ideas and work. Well, and and I would say the self. Uh, yes, and plenty of other ideas, and I think his own, his own creative daimon Mm -hmm. uh, was always leading him uh, through, through life. Mm -hmm. 
so some partnership between you know ego and something yes. Yes. and something greater and and he went to some real pains to disabuse people who projected you know wise man guru status mm-hmm. uh onto onto him yeah yeah uh and, and i think you know i'm going back to judy garland of that the, there are people and where the danger is is that rather than achieving your own sense of self and uh, uh, offering your work or your talent, uh, that then you really need the the fame, the applause, mm-hmm. the validation, the lifestyle, the whatever it is, um, to augment uh, a sense of self that is essentially you know, not sufficiently sturdy, stable, and and whole. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A- and and I think we see this today on all the social media stuff of people who want to to quote go viral unquote. Right. right. Uh, 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 that other people seeing them and validating them contributes to a sense of self. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I want to I want to go there in a minute, but just staying with this idea that you just raised about the daimon, you know, um, uh, Hellman talks about this beautifully in the soul's code, which is the sense, you know, some people just sort of maybe have a destiny. So it's mentioning my, the person that I worked with who just had this, you know, just incredible talent. You know, if we if we take a look at someone like uh, Taylor Swift, now I'm not an aficionado mm-hmm. on her work. But I, I do know a couple of songs, <laughs> and I, you know I think she's really quite talented. I think she writes really great songs. I think she's got a great voice. As far as I can tell, she's a wonderful entertainer, right? So she's you know she's sort of she's kind of got the whole package. It's not you know you can't you can't look at her and say that her fame is uh, undeserved. You know she's she's really very talented. So I, I can imagine what Hillman might say about her is that this is her destiny. It is her destiny to be an entertainer. It is her destiny to be a musician. She is living out her destiny. And part fame is fame is almost like a byproduct of 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 following her her diamond. F- fame is mm-hmm. is it just kind of comes with a package, and and I think that. That 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 is that is true for for certain people that this is this is just kind of what they were mm-hmm. destined to do, and I guess part of what they then have to do is figure out how to carry the burden of fame, knowing, of course, that they're always running the risk of being, you know, um, finding themselves on the other side of it with someone kind of eager to 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 tear them apart, you know, and also that one can lose one's footing. Because, you know, remember when the Beatles said something like, we're, we're more famous than God? Do I have that quote right? One mm. of them said that. I think, I think that's a quote, we're more famous than God. And, you know, arguably, maybe they were. But, but that, you know, the, the sort of inflation that comes with that and then how that can uh, help, you know, cause us to lose our way psycho-spiritually. You know, in, in Rome, the, the coronation of the emperor the emperor would mm. uh, ride through Rome to throngs of cheering crowds, you know, dressed in imperial purple. And the story mm-hmm. is that there would be a slave standing in the chariot next to him, whispering in his ear, remember you are mortal. You know, it's like you, you've got to remember that you're just an average person, no matter what is getting projected on you, no matter how much power the world has given you. Mm-hmm. You know, you are just ordinary, and how do we how do we remember that when we're being swept along? Uh, so um, I, I think that you know, if it's our destiny to be famous, and I think for some of us it is not not myself, yeah. but uh, someone like Taylor Swift. Um, you know, how do we how do we hold on to ourselves? It's it's almost a, something like a practice, I imagine. I'm thinking so much about uh, what is external and what we can do and get 
uh, in the external world and and how precious and central and important and inescapable our inner world is. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some of these uh, stars that I mentioned a little while back who, um, who came to such sad, mm -hmm. sad endings, Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley and Michael Jackson, for example, yeah. Um I I was a great appreciator of John Belushi. I just loved him on Saturday Night Live. But that for all of us one way or another uh the injunction is to find work and relationships in the world that matter. Mm -hmm. And develop our our internal sense of self. And that some of these celebrities, t great talents, Janis Joplin, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, were were swept away yeah. because, of course, fame came to them young, mm -hmm. uh, and developing a sense of self um, is the work at least of the first half of life, mm -hmm. if not your entire life. Yeah, uh, that we that's what our our task in life is it is to turn inward and become uh, who we were innately meant to be, and yeah. serve serve that, serve our own souls, and serve people and work in the world, and and not identify with it. Yeah. Uh, of you know, do do I have to have the corner office? Do I have to drive a Lamborghini? Do I have to have a stadium filled with thousands of people applauding? Mm -hmm. or, what am I really here? What am I really here to do? Mm -hmm. You know, um, so so I'm thinking about people who who are tremendously talented, who you know, sort of were 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 led through life by the diamond and may have wound up uh, at, yeah. you know, with a dark end. I mean, someone like Garland, for example. I mean, you know, God, what a voice, you know. I, I mean, just, mm. just amazing. Um, yeah, a huge admirer of hers, you know. But, but you know, she, she had, and actually she ta uh, Hillman talks about her in The Soul's Code, you know that that she was just mm -hmm. a little itty bitty thing, and she saw mm -hmm. some kids performing, and she saw okay. this girl step forward, this little four or five year old girl, and sing a solo, and she was just enwrapped. And as soon as it was over, she turned to her father. She said, "Can I do that, Daddy?" And soon yeah. after, she did. Um, so you know, this was this was really something she just knew right from the beginning that mm -hmm. this was going to this was something she had to do. And then there's this other thing that you, that Deb you've alluded to, and I kept on saying, "Oh, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there," which is this <laughs> this sort of internet culture. So people kind of seeking fame uh, almost for its own sake. Yes. And I w I want to talk about this um, really remarkable essay. Um, that I uh, have read, then we'll we'll put it in the show notes. But um, if there's a there's a this uh, article that's written by this um, Substack uh, writer that I really really like. the The Substack is by Gerwinder, and the title of this post, and we'll link it in the show notes, is "The Perils of Audience Capture." Because again, I think we're we're in this realm of projection. And how dangerous it can be. So, um, Gerwinder starts talking about uh, someone, a, a 24 year old man named Nicholas Perry, who wanted to be big online. So, he was um, posting videos of himself playing the violin and talking about veganism. And he wasn't getting any notice. So, he started, he gave up being a vegan, he started posting videos of himself eating just you know kind of eating dinner and kind of talking to the audience and um people started people started liking those videos so then the comment section of the videos were in, encouraging him to uh eat as much as he physically could 
So we started doing that. And the audience applauded, but always demanded more. And so then he was, you know, filming himself uh, eating entire menus of fast food restaurants in one sitting. I'm, so, I'm sort of uh, paraphrasing and reading from um, Gerwinder's post. So I just want to credit that. So, you know, he eventually got over 6 million subscribers on YouTube from, from you know, eating. And he is now fantastically, grotesquely obese. He must weigh, you know, some five or 600 pounds. Um, and, and so I'm just going to read here from, from the Substack. Um, Nick Accato, so he's now known as Nick Accato Avocado. That's his YouTube name. Nick Accato, molded by his audience's desires into a cartoonish extreme, is now a wholly different character from Nicholas Perry, the vegan violinist who first started making videos. Where Perry was mild-mannered and health-conscious, Nick Accato is loud, abrasive, and spectacularly mm. grotesque. Where Perry was a picky eater, Nick Accato devoured everything he could, including, finally, Perry himself. The rampant appetite for attention caused the person to be subsumed by the persona. And, and so he, he terms this audience capture. And I think it's a really interesting uh, phenomenon that, that, you know, I could point to other examples. There's a, a, an extremely anorexic woman named Eugenia Cooney, I think is her name, who, who does all of this stuff and is kind of applauded for being just again, grotesquely thin. So this is a particular phenomenon of, you know, TikTok and Instagram where, where the projections of the, the fans, as it were, um, shape and mold and capture and finally destroy the person. Uh, and and I, th I think it's an extreme example of what can happen in fame in any case. But it's particularly dark. It's particularly dark. And again, you know, if if you're if you're if you're well known because you're in service to something larger than yourself, like mm -hmm. Jung was, I think you're you're on steadier ground. If you're chasing fame and attention for its own sake, it will devour you. The uh, parallel uh, to the the Greek play. Mm -hmm. about the Maenads and about Dionysus uh, is really powerful. And that we've talked about this as uh, this is the stuff of the gods. Yeah. And uh, Dionysus infused his followers uh, with, with this frenzy. And, uh, you know, whether it's uh, uh, fueled by uh, drugs or alcohol or psychic energy, Mm -hmm. uh, that is exactly what happens, is that we can't get enough of it. It's not within ego control. And eventually it can devour people. Uh, followers lose all sense of what a person is like uh, in, in the projection of somebody that you know, can eat all manner of things mm -hmm. uh, in, in an astonishing way. Uh, well, the person is not under consideration here. Mm -hmm. There's no relationship. It's just uh, an egging on, a cheering on, a, I dare you, I dare you. Uh, and if we take that on, uh, either as a would-be celebrity mm -hmm. or as a fan, uh, we are inflated and we are not grounded. Uh, and it's heady and it can be really destructive and dangerous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that that is, you said something, Deb, that I want to pick up on, that, the, you know, the person is not under consideration. There, There is a way that... Being famous, I imagine, <laughs> never, never having been famous, nor will I ever be, but, but my imagination is it totally flattens the individual. Yes. You know, you, 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 if you're really famous, 
you know, I mean, I don't, I don't follow Taylor Swift, but people in my family will occasionally give me reports. Apparently, it's very yeah. difficult for her to date, and and of course it is because you know who 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 are you going to date if you're Taylor Swift? And what are those? How do those dates go? I don't know. Uh, gee, how is your day today? I mean, you know, it's it's like who's going to relate to you like you're a normal person? Who's going to just uh, be interested in getting to know you for who you are. Mm-hmm. Who's going to n- not, not, you know, be, be, you know, nervous, you know, when they, when they talk to you and, and sort of feel like the sun is in their eyes because they're talking to Taylor Swift. Um, I mean, I, th- I think it, it deprives one of their humanity in a way to, to, to be that yeah. famous. You know, this takes me back to something uh, you mentioned a little while ago, which is, you know, what if you are, as Jung was, and as many a person who's truly talented is, if you are born with a diamond, if you are born with a drive Mm -hmm. to to create, uh, Mm -hmm. to write poetry, to sing, to uh, uh, any one of a number of things, if that kind of gift and creative urge uh, is yours, and, and Jung wrote about it at the end of his life, he, he said very movingly that uh, that was what he was in service to, that his daimon mm-hmm. yeah. uh, drove him and guided him of h- how, you know, I'm imagining Taylor Swift uh, has a diamond. Yeah, I would. A- and, and and then it is that person's special gift and a burden to to manage that. Yeah. Uh, yes. So that so that there is uh, private time, personal time, and the ability to make a separation between who the public self is mm-hmm. a- and who who the private or personal self is. And it can be hard because the maynads that are out there, the fans, just want more and more and more and more. And you get sucked in, as yep. did Janis Joplin, mm-hmm. to being forced to do more tours and more performances. Uh, and at one point she begged to be given a time out. Oh, I didn't know that. And... Okay. uh but it takes on a force of its own because it is of the gods. Mm-hmm. But it needs to belong in the realm of the gods, not mm-hmm. in the realm of, of humans, ego control. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not to us yeah. to arrogate those powers to ourselves. But, but you know, th- that brings me to another famous person who met a very sad end, and that's Princess Diana. Oh, because my. you know, because because it yes, I mean, it, I suppose if you're a, a very famous person, you need to, uh, you know, try to make sure that you you have your private life. But we know that that can be very difficult for famous people, that they're constantly being hounded by the paparazzi, and everywhere they go, you know, someone's taking a picture of them, and if they you know, show up the grocery store, there's someone, you know, reporting on it or something like that. Um, so, so I, I, I think it's, it's, it's really, it's really, it's really difficult. And I, I, I sort of just feel terrible when I see the way celebrities are treated. I'm just not interested in participating it in it at all. So I, I try to kind of avert my eyes. Actually, I don't, I don't really want to know, you know, who, who was seen where with whom. Um, but but you know the the royal family in general and Princess Diana in particular is a good example of that that they just they cannot escape the kind of constant projection generating machine and and for them it's um, oh it's well that's a special case isn't it? it it really is because in some sense that's sort of their job to carry those projections. But um, but certainly it it uh, mm-hmm. it's it's incredibly intrusive and very difficult to have a normal life. And in the case of uh, the British 
royal family, uh, we can really see the polarity uh, between their being larger than life, everybody's very, very interested in them, their beautiful children, uh, ribbon cutting ceremonies, uh, that they are more than Mm -hmm. Um, sort of the average commoner. And on the flip side of that, uh, the British tabloid press is vicious. Yes. Uh, Paparazzi follow them, send drones drones, uh, over swimming pools, uh, go to all kinds of lengths to sort of uncover uh, salacious uh, conversations, Mm -hmm. details, photographs, uh, we really see the polarity there between being larger than life and then uh, being uh, ripped ripped apart like Pentheus by the Maenads. Yes. Well, and, and it is like we, we both want to admire them. You know, we there's something mm-hmm. irresistible about, uh, you know, um, imag- imagining their lives and seeing pictures of their lives and... Uh, but at the same time, we we also we want to find out the salacious details. We want to bring them down. So there's there's both. We want to lift them up and we want to bring them down. And I think I think yeah. any of us can can find both of those impulses within us if we're honest with ourselves. That that desire to elevate mm. someone and admire someone and that that desire to, you know, I mean, I think envy with the royal family is, um, yeah. is, uh, is certainly very, very active. And, you know, setting aside that there, there might be some kind of very sober uh, uh, desires to evaluate the, the worth of those positions to the culture, but, but there's mm-hmm. certainly just something like envy in there too. Now, we haven't uh, really walked around envy, and let's let's take a minute and do that. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think envy is hugely important. Mm-hmm. Uh, that if you have been given a gift, if you're a member yes. of a royal family, well, then you yes. just got the luck of the draw. Uh, you happen to be um, Charles and Diana's kid. Well, mm-hmm. good for you, lucky you, but you didn't earn it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you just kind of landed there. Mm-hmm. Um, other gifts also people develop, but they haven't earned. Uh, and the, the place that, that I go with that is sports stars. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I imagine that I, I could have, I don't know, trained and practiced and you know, at some sport, and I, I can promise you that if I spent 10 hours a day playing tennis, I, I, believe me, whatever that special gift is, um, it, it would never have happened. And so I wonder if the envy is about <laughs> half the other person with you. Uh, having been given a gift and why them and not me. How come I didn't get one of those magical uh, singing mm-hmm. voices, or incredible physical talent, or or genius brain like let's say Steve great, Jobs, great, great beauty. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'll take that. Um, mm-hmm. And I wonder if that's where the envy comes from. Is mm-hmm. how come you and not me? What mm-hmm. did you do? Mm-hmm. Uh, how mm-hmm. come the gods favored you? Which takes me back to. Uh, the story of Psyche and Eros of mm-hmm. she she was a princess she was mortal, and how come she was so incredibly beautiful? Yeah, her sisters yeah, were envious. The goddess herself was envious. Yes, yes, that's great, Deb. I really like that because I I think that we it's true that when we're talking about fame, mm. certainly certainly I would I I would be willing to bet that most famous people whether they're writers or sports stars or, or singers, you know, Taylor Swift, I would be willing to bet you anything. They work really hard. Most of them, most of them work really hard and, and are not there, you know, because they just, that they just kind of stepped in it. I mean, other than maybe Charles and Diana's kids, you know, and they have 
they have to work hard in a different way. But but someone who's famous for something they've achieved, there's certainly a lot of hard work in the equation. However, there really is something about they just when the gifts were being handed out, man, they just <laughs> they just lucked out. You know, they they got. Yeah you know, amazing brains or beauty or talent, or even some people, Lord knows, have all of those things, you know? Uh, and it's like, wow, why, why you and not me? You know, so I think you're right. I think, I think there's mm -hmm. something, again, it's like remarkable. We recognize mm -hmm. that these people have, have, you know, been touched by the gods and, and mm -hmm. we want to be close to them. You know, the, the thing about someone who's famous is you want to be in their presence, you you want to uh, you know find yourself sitting next to them on the airplane, or I can remember this is a little embarrassing. But <laughs> when I was in high school, my favorite band was The Clash, and uh, I went to see them a bunch of times. And once I you know hung around afterwards and got to meet Joe Strummer, and it was just like wow, you know I'm like. I'm like in his presence, you know, um, or, or that thing. It's like, oh, I'm not going to, if you fake, you shake the hand of a famous person, you say, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to wash my hands ever again. You know, it's like somehow if we can be close to them, we can be touched with some of that magic too. Mm -hmm. um, but then, but then there is this sense of like, why, why did those people get it? And I didn't. So envy yeah. can definitely be there. You know, I think I want to um, say a word about the antidote to, to all of this. And, and I hear you that that's right. But some of it will rub off on me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that I, too, can have something of the magic. But, right. uh, you know, the old Buddhist saying is, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Mm -hmm. And after enlightenment, chop wood, carry yeah. water. Yeah. And, and that e each of us has, has a destiny, has a soul, has mm -hmm. a life to live. And I've been thinking on and off this whole time about an aunt and uncle that I had mm. who, uh, in effect, adopted us kids as family friends not biologically related. The love, the attention, mm -hmm. uh, the interest, the generosity of taking us places, exposing us uh, to things like our town's repertory theater, mm -hmm. not, not big Hollywood stuff, uh, taking us on picnics, coming to visit us when we were in college, has been a gift of a lifetime. Mm. As far as I'm concerned, uh, that is hard to beat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that I just want to take us back to relationships and humanity mm -hmm. and, and love. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, that's the other side here of mm -hmm. being out in public and having having fame and applause and maybe lots and lots of money. Um, that's not all there is. Yeah. And, I, and I don't think it is the soul mm -hmm. of what we're really here to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, perhaps we will transition to a dream. And before we do, I want to remind everyone, as we always do, about Patreon. So we, uh, we analyze your dreams if you're a patron. We uh, answer your questions. And uh, so you, if you like our dream interpretation and maybe you've submitted dreams a bunch of times and we've never picked your dream, I just want you to know that I... I am the dream picker, and I, I look at our recent dreams. I try to pick a recent dream, and I try to pick a dream that maybe is, you know, about the right length, and I like, if possible, to sort of be as representative as I can and sometimes pick 
the dreams from men or younger people or older people. And, and I also want to pick a dream that, um, you know, that I feel is going to be of interest to our audience. So, uh, sometimes I like to pick dreams that are fairly straightforward. And sometimes I like to pick dreams that are really, really opaque. And just, I know we're not going to be do, able to do a whole lot with, but that's the way dreams are. So, um, <laughs> those are my criteria. And so if your dream hasn't been picked, I'm sorry, but if you become a patron, you have a much better chance of getting your dream pick because we we get we get just you know uh, dozens of dreams uh, submitted every week uh, for the podcast. But as a patron, um, at the ten or twenty five dollar level a month, um, we don't we don't get that many dreams. So it's much much more intimate. So mm -hmm. consider becoming a patron if you go to our website thisunionlife dot com. And then under podcast, there's a drop down menu and it says become our patron. So now the dream. Today's dreamer is a woman. Uh, she's 43 years old and she's an adjunct uh, professor at a university. And she has titled her dream going back to the university. And here's the dream. I'm called back to the university with other members of my cohort. Not everybody goes back. I'm supposed to take a few courses that were later added to the curriculum. Failing to take these courses could cancel my degree, so I go. I'm having difficulty logging into my student account because I don't remember my credentials, so I can't find the time in the classroom of the classes. I miss my classes and feel ashamed because it will ruin my reputation in the eyes of my favorite professor. I start to CCE critical and, and claim in my mind that I have a PhD. Is why, uh, so why should I take undergraduate courses when I'm capable of, of teaching them? My cohort is hanging around and I can't be part of the group and almost nobody cares that I am there, even my best friends. I try to find the registrar's office to discuss why I shouldn't be there. Then I go back to my apartment that I used to live in on campus. I don't have the key, but the door is not locked. My room is still the way it was. My clothes, my bed, and furniture are still there. But my roommates are college kids. Sometimes my room is replaced with another room that is not as good because I have not been there. I never see the roommates, but I see their rooms. I try to reclaim my room, but again, I can't reach anyone to do this switch. I see this dream quite often. I am not happy, she says in her context. I'm not happy in academia. I feel exploited and not important. I'm transitioning to a completely different career that has nothing to do with academia. I have been searching for what occupation can really help me use my potential and makes me happy. And she adds, I feel left out from my cohort, misevaluated by the college, and there's no one there to talk to and prove that I do not have to take these courses. While I'm happy to see my room is there, I feel insecure because the building feels not familiar anymore. And she adds, I had the best time of my life during college. I lived on campus and had the best friendships that still last. I've been living abroad for about two years, and she's uh, leery of going back, not being understood or left out, and that that makes her feel fearful and upset. So we have this dream about uh, the dreamer kind of going back to an old situation. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, um, this is not an uncommon dream that mm. I'm back in school and there's a test that I still have to take. <laughs> yes. Um, there's, you know, there's, I forgot, I never took this class. Now I have to go back and take this class. So this is actually one of those kind of con common dream themes. But this one's a little bit more, isn't it? Um, yes, it is. There's a lot about going back, and, and I, can, I can really uh, kind of empathize with this dreamer. It sounds like in some way she, uh, she feels like she may have peaked in college, mm -hmm. and somehow that has led her 
you know, she's found herself in a bit of a cul-de-sac in life. She's in a field she doesn't find rewarding. And, and she's, uh, you know, she's a little bit um, out of gas and has to figure out how to get started. And her career that she's now switching out of, you know, I wonder, you know, this is a real reach, but uh, of a way to stay in that stage of life of to extend the college experience um, by moving on and being part of uh, uh, becoming a teacher, becoming mm -hmm. as she is an adjunct, an adjunct professor. Um, and you're right. The first part of that dream is, you know, that classic anxiety uh, dream of mm -hmm. I have to take the test, but I can't find the building. And right. oh my God, I never even took the class. Right, right, right. Uh, uh, but what she says in her dream is that uh, she doesn't really understand in the dream. The dream ego doesn't understand why should I take these classes. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I could be teaching them, mm -hmm. so it it is a little different from I, I can't get there from here. Mm -hmm. It's a little more of I've outgrown this. Although you know, whenever someone brings in the stream, like I was back in high school and I had to take chemistry because I <laughs> lost my transcript or something like that, I always think. Um, I always think, okay, what's the unfinished business from back then? What didn't mm -hmm. you learn? So, so what, what, is, what does she say? There have been some classes added that she needs to take. Otherwise, her right. degree will be uh, considered, in, in, will be invalidated. Right. Okay. So there's something she should have learned back then that she didn't learn. And the ego thinks, I'm, you know, I'm better than this. Mm-hmm. But that's that's not what the dream maker's saying. The dream maker's saying there's some there's something you should have learned back then that you didn't. And uh, and it and it kind of goes down hard, you know, to have to square yourself with that. That that in some sense it's kind of back to basics. Mm -hmm. And Deb, I mean, I, I I recognize that you were that you were sort of you know making it up when you said oh maybe she chose to stay in academia because it was such a good experience but mm -hmm. acknowledging that that's just our projection and our fantasy i i'm a i absolutely. like it um yeah. you know it's certainly understandable that if you know college was kind of a peak experience that you would that that it would make sense that you'd say great i'm going to stay in academia let me become a professor um and and perhaps 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 that that um, kind of easy choice to stay in the field, which we actually don't know that it was, um, is a way of avoiding some harder decision that now has to be reckoned with. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to the second, what I think of as sort of the second scene in the dream. Of uh, First, there's a part about uh, taking these classes. It reminds me of you know, what we have to do to maintain our licenses. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you yeah. know, that, that every so many years they say, do you, have you taken some, some extra courses yeah. to keep your knowledge up to date? Um, yeah, that's and, interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, but then uh, no one cares that she's there, even her best friends. Uh, she goes to the registrar's office and then scene two is I go back to my apartment that I used to live in. I don't have the key. The door is not locked. Everything is there. Mm -hmm. Her clothes, her bed, um, but her roommates are college kids. And I think mm -hmm. that is, is significant because that hints at a, a younger stage and, and age mm -hmm. of that they are college kids and... Uh, she is still in a dorm room, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but aware aware of the difference between her and and her new uh, roommates. So uh, and then at the oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go, you go ahead. Uh, but then at the end, uh, I think she's referencing other dreams. Uh, sometimes my room is replaced by another room that's not as good because I've not been there. In other words, she hasn't been. 
in that room, in the college, um, in her dreams, in her psyche. Mm -hmm. And then she says, I try to reclaim my room, but I can't reach anyone to do the switch. Mm -hmm. So it does hint at a time of, that isn't fitting mm -hmm. any, anymore. But our dream ego, uh, which is often very like our waking ego, mm -hmm. our dream, dream ego keeps trying. You know, I, I think this woman's at a major kind of crossroads in her life, right? She's really mm -hmm. rethinking this um, decisions and career of the past 20 or so years. She's right smack in the middle of the midlife transition. This is a hard mm. time. I really feel empathy mm -hmm. with this streamer. And it, it's sort of like back to the drawing board. Now I have to, what do I want to be when I grow up and I'm 43? Um, and the thing is that when we do that, we often do regress to an earlier stage in life. I mean, in, a, in, a, in what is ultimately a constructive, creative way, by the way, there's a there's a, a discussion in psychoanalysis in general, and then Jung talked about it too. He, of course, used the French for, for it, Recoulier pour mieux sauter. You know, that wow. we have to, we have, I, know, <laughs> I, know I pulled that one out this morning. But, you know, that, that you want, sometimes you want to share back, what it means. <laughs> that you go back in, to be able to better jump forward. Mm -hmm. So, and oftentimes when we are at a crossroads, we are looking, we are reviewing the past. We're looking at, you know, what decision was good and what decision maybe would I go back and make differently or what mm -hmm. could I do differently now? What worked? What didn't work? Where, am I, where were my assumptions faulty? Or maybe they were right for then, but they're no longer right. There, there is a kind of regression that goes on in order to better move forward. And I, I think this dream is a really good example of that. Mm -hmm. So she is kind of regressing to being back in college. She, there, there is some knowledge she didn't get then. Mm -hmm. There is some kind of unfinished developmental tasks, maybe. I mean, again, you know, Deb, you and I are totally having this fantasy about, about this dreamer, and I'm, I'm acknowledging mm -hmm. that. But to stay attached to the alma mater, to the mother mm -hmm. of the university, uh, you know, may have represented a kind of um, skipping over of a developmental milestone to to go through this difficult thing where you say, well, who am I really? You know, but instead you just kind of went with what's there. Well, now now you have to do that. Now that that bill is kind mm -hmm. of come due. But also, you know, what what is it like to go back to my college self, to remember the things that I loved, the things that energized yeah. me? the friendships that sustained me, what can I bring forward from that time of my life to yes. uh, help me shape where I go now? So it's both and. It's a very kind of complex time, I'm sure. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of uh, legitimacy to going back. People go back and we engage those conversations with people. Mm -hmm. of what did you what did you love yes. when you were a child what did you Absolutely. love when you were a teenager oh my gosh i was really into cooking i uh, did all this and that and the other to to see what is the kernel there mm -hmm. of what what was it about that mm -hmm. time that story that activity uh not that you're going to repeat that particular activity again but you're trying to find the threads exactly. of here's the stuff that really turned me on mm -hmm. that uh, in these various stories, what I really loved was yeah, yeah. Uh, so that you can take your history and find some fresh way uh, to bring it forward and apply it to uh, where the future mm -hmm. uh, is headed and where you're headed. Mm hmm. Uh, we use the past to um, help us uh, with the future. Mm -hmm. a and uh, it is a hard time, isn't it? Uh, the forties yeah. are a hard. The forties yeah. are a hard time. Absolutely. Uh, so we we, we yeah. certainly wish this dreamer mm. all the best. Absolutely. 
You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.